How's it going and welcome to No Fun Allowed's guide series on the Wild Beyond the Witchlight, a 5th edition module. In today's video we'll be going over the name locations of the Land of Yawn. Of course there's going to be a ton of spoilers so players don't watch this, but DMs don't want that added insight. Go ahead and stick around because we've got a lot to cover here. So here they are, the name locations of Yawn. What's interesting about these locations compared to the other ones is there doesn't need to be your players going to these locations. Your players don't need to go to the Henge, to the Mine, or to the Beacons, technically. It even spells it out right here in the locations that your players could go to them. You can place them in whatever path. These locations can be explored in any order or not at all. What I'm going to tell you is they are well worth exploring because there's a lot of fun interactions to be had there, a lot of fun roleplay to be had, and a lot of potential combat to be had there. But it really comes down to what are you trying to get out of this game. Do you want your players to have to deal with a sort of civil war going on between the Chords and the Brigand Rocks? Do you want your players to have to figure out the social dynamics of interacting with the Fae Beacons? How do you want your players to go about this land? I certainly think that they're all three worth running and I have ran them myself. But the question is, is does it belong in your game? Well, it obviously comes down to what you want out of the game. Now the real question is, if you are running all of these name locations, then what order do you have them in? Do you go as the book is and have the henge, then the beacons, and then the mine? Eh, that sort of doesn't make any sense. It would make sense that if they go to the henge, and then to the mine, and then possibly stop by the fey beacons. Maybe your players go to the fey beacons first, and then go to the henge, and then go to the mine. Maybe your players go to the mine, and then go to the henge. And the fey beacons are kind of on their own, but the real dynamic issue is the Brigand Rock mine and the Lockberry henge. If your players go to the mine first, then there actually is some information that is missing and your players may not be pertinent to all of it. And this is especially true if you go to the Brigand Rock Mine and then to the Lockberry Henge. There is some of that flavor text you're going to have to change or just omit entirely for it to make sense. But we're going to walk through that right now. Most important of all being, if you have a group that simply just wants to get to Motherhorn, then they can technically just skip all these things and go straight to Motherhorn. But there is the added fun caveat that if your players do go to the Brigand Rock Mine, they can get themselves a secret passage all the way to Motherhorn, which is pretty cool. But if you have a group that just simply shows up to Yon and they say, oh, we don't care about any of this stuff, we're just going to go straight to there, then maybe you allow it. The first location I'm going to cover here is the Lockberry Henge. The Lockberry Henge is the meeting place of eight Chord Clans. Now the thing to remember is that this is not the home of all of those Chord Clans, this is simply just a meeting place. That makes me believe that all of the Chords are spread out all over the place, and then this is just a middle point. It may not necessarily be the absolute middle point, but this is definitely the location where they all convene. When your players arrive to this Stonehenge looking area for the first time, they will see that there is a chess game that was clearly interrupted. And the reason why it looks recent is because there is dying embers at the campfire. So that's a clear indication that there was some recent activity. Now your players may be curious, start looking around, maybe asking some questions, maybe start percepting around, but what's really going to tip off of this area is the fact that if your players make a survival check with a DC of 12, they can notice that there are small footprints that lead to the stones. Once your players make their way over to the stones, or if they do something else, we'll get to that in a moment, that is when the cores are going to appear. Now, if your players just come in and they're total scumbags, if they flip over the board, or if they start defacing the rocks, or doing whatever to just disrupt this place, then the cores are going to pop out and attack. Now, what I would suggest is, if your players do deface these things, what I would say is the cores have a round of attacking, and at the same time, they're also expounding out, how dare you deface this place, and as they're attacking, and... If your players decide to say, hey, hey, we didn't mean it, then you could have the fight come to a stop. But if your players fight back, then hey, it's all war, baby. Now, if your players are very cordial when they arrive, either they just simply meander up to the stones, or if they complete this game using a DC-14 insight check, that is when the chords are going to pop out and say, hey, we mean you no harm, we are the chords of this location. Now, what's really cool about this is if your players do succeed in that insight check and set up the game-winning move, then the queen is going to reward them actually quite handsomely. Queen Argantel of all of the chords of Yawn is going to reward the individual with a star sapphire worth a thousand gold to give it to the characters. If the gift is accepted, which I don't know why the heck your players wouldn't do it, unless they're really skeptical, I guess. If they do accept it, then it begins to glow faintly, and for the next 24 hours, this acts as a stone of good luck. 
And what's really cool about this is the Stone of Good Luck does not require attunement. And that is just a flat plus one to all ability checks and saving throws. Pretty freaking strong, and it doesn't require attunement. Not that this adventure is actually that heavy on attunement slots, mind you, but... You know, I know a lot of people overhaul their own games and make it Monty Hall and add all the magical items. So having a item here that doesn't require too much is pretty cool. Now, once the cords have finally come out and they are willing to talk to the party, they are going to reveal some very important information here. The cords no longer hold gatherings at this henge. That is because they fear Bitter End. And Bitter End is just their nickname for Endolin Moongrave. So if your players don't catch on to that, then just have one and say, oh yeah, that's what we call Endolin Moongrave. Your players will also be told that Endolin Moongrave used shears to cut off the queen's hair. The hag fashions cord hair into iron ropes and uses them to manipulate her theater's infernal contraptions. Pretty gnarly stuff. And as well, Bitter End uses a contraption called the Orrery of Tragedies to glimpse all possible futures. Copper rods on the mountain tops of Yawn capture lightning and chattel into this device. So this right here, if your players hear about this, they may get the inclination to start damaging them. And once again, we will be getting into what happens if your players do decide to damage any of the copper rods later on. So what I would suggest is during this roleplay segment, have these people look like a proud people who are now in hiding because they fear this evil hag. Have them appear as if they were once strong but are now incredibly weak. And that should hopefully drive your players into a sense of, hey, maybe if we rally against the hag, then we can have these people by our side. Now, at any point during the conversation, or when you feel it's most dramatic, that is when you're going to move on to the distant racket. You're gonna see out this little blurb, but the thing that's really gonna be striking is, if your players haven't seen these people be violent yet, then them saying death to the Brigand Rocks is definitely gonna be like, whoa, what's going on here? Once your players start talking to the cords, the cords are going to reveal that the Brigand Rocks are helping Bitter End build wicked contraptions. They also hide in guard schematic diagrams for new contraptions in their mind. This is actually false though. That is because the hag has actually kidnapped a Brigand Rock architect. The cords can't stand the noise of Brigand Rock mining, so they craft statues and leave them outside the mine's entrance, hoping to frighten the Brigand Rocks into leaving. And your players will definitely see this once they go to the Brigand Rock mine. They're gonna see that there's a whole bunch of statues, and they're definitely trying to scare them away. And your players will be told a Galeb Dur working for the Cords infiltrated the mine and overheard several Brigand Rocks talking about a secret tunnel that connects the mine to Motherhorn. The tunnel is hidden by Brigand Rock magic. So if your players get told this, they're probably going to be thinking to themselves, okay, the Brigand Rocks are on the Hag side, let's go beat them up or do whatever. Now, if you've been running a pure non combat sort of campaign, then this may be coming out of left field and your players may be skeptical. Or your players may be thinking to themselves, okay, is this the first time we're going to be getting into combat? That might very well be the case, but once your players get the full picture, then they may start thinking otherwise. Now, what's really cool about this is, as all of the cords are being agitated and fired up, if your players show any sort of sentiment toward this and the cords grow to like the PCs, that is when a ceremonial dance is going to occur. Any character who joins the boisterous dance can impress the cords using a DC 14 athletic or performance check. Characters who succeed on this are then given the ability of command hair trait from the cords. Pretty cool. Now this new ability your players earned is a bonus action called command hair and this cord, which is now of course your PC, has at least one 50 foot long rope woven out of their hair, but it doesn't need to be the PC's hair, it just needs to be cord hair. The PC commands one such rope within 30 feet of it to move up to 20 feet and entangle a large or smaller creature. That target must make a DC 13 dexterity saving throw or become grappled, and if they are grappled in this way, they are restrained. The PC can use a bonus action to release the target, which is also freed if the PC dies or becomes incapacitated. In addition to that, the rope of hair has an AC of 20 and 20 HP. It regains one hit point at the start of each of its turns. If the rope drops to zero HP, it is destroyed. So very, very strong. What I would suggest is it doesn't work on any living cord because that just would be totally weird if your PCs could start controlling the hair around these people. But what it is, is it allows your PCs to activate all of the hair located at Motherhorn, which could prove pretty awesome later on. Now, if your players have been given all these goodies and they make friends with all these cords, they're probably going to be on the warpath. They're going to be thinking to themselves, okay, these Brigand Rocks are working with the Hag. These Brigand Rocks are obviously causing a huge commotion. And they may very well decide to go to Brigand Rock Mine to put a stop to all of it. Now, what I really like about this section is, of course, depending on who you meet first, 
this is going to drastically impact the role play elements here. And it also really depends on your player's disposition. If they are willing to just go on the fighting train, then they may very well just head over there and start fighting. But if they are of the mentality that they can get themselves out of every situation in this campaign through diplomacy, then they're probably going to be approaching it with more of an open mind and may see through the gaps in the logic here. This whole encounter and circumstance is very entertaining because it is going to be drastically different depending on your player's approach to this entire campaign. Now what's really nice here is if your players see through all this and decide diplomacy is the way to go, your players can approach each faction's leaders and say, hey, the other people are not working for the hag, the hag is actually using the both of you. At which point, then a truce is going to be declared. And what's really good about this outcome is after this meeting, the Cords and the Briganox are going to unite and to aid the characters at Motherhorn. And this is described later on at Motherhorn. So I love using factions where your players have a significant influence on what faction they have aiding them. And what's really cool about this is your players could have one, the other, both, or neither, depending on their actions. So it's really dynamic, it's really unique. Even though this campaign does feel a bit more railroaded in a sense, there is a lot of different options going on here. And once again, your player's decisions and impact on the world is going to drastically change what goes on. Now for our next name location, we have the Brigand Rock Mine. Your players may arrive here first or they may arrive here because they think that this is the way to go. And there they are. They approach this location and there actually is a pretty nice little art handout here. And that can definitely be very creepy. If your players did not interact with the chords before, then seeing this weird sight of stone creatures being built to look at this entrance would definitely be creepy as can be. So that's definitely one merit to having your players go to the Brig and Rock Mine first. But if your players have already interacted with the chords, then they'll have already been told that, hey, these things are just statues, and that's that. Now, when your players arrive, they're going to hear the sound of hundreds of pickaxes and hammers chipping away at the stone. But the interesting thing is, as they enter the mine, the tapping noise stops. Now why is that? That is because your party is being lured into a trap. As your players explore around, they'll discover that there is nobody. But after 10 minutes of navigating this mine, each character must succeed on a DC-19 constitution saving throw or fall asleep for one hour. Now, of course, some PCs are going to succeed and some are going to be immune to sleep. So this is a very dynamic thing of... Does everyone fall asleep? Does nobody fall asleep? Or very importantly and more than likely is gonna happen is there might be one, two, three PCs that succeed, but then the rest fall asleep. Now, if you've got a whole bunch of NPCs following along, I usually just like to relegate it to they follow the majority. If the majority of PCs are passed out, then maybe the majority of the NPCs are passed out. But if all of them fail, then all the NPCs fail. If all of the PCs succeed, then all the NPCs succeed. I like to keep it simple like that. Now the important thing here is creatures that are put asleep in this way can't be awakened early by any means short of a wish spell. Meaning it doesn't matter if you beat them up, it doesn't matter if you slap them around, it doesn't matter. They are sleeping. That's the end of story. And that's very scary because if you're last man standing and you look around and you shake everybody and you hit them and do whatever and they can't wake up, then you're going to feel kind of alone. But thankfully, this isn't a combat encounter unless your players make it. After several minutes of your party becoming asleep, or maybe not falling asleep, then Brigand Rocks are going to appear on the scene. If everybody's asleep, then they're simply going to just cover everyone up, tie them to the ground, and then get ready for the confrontation. Now, if even one party member is still awake, then the Brigand Rocks are going to look, turn around real quick, and vamoose. But, there is one individual who is going to stand amongst the ranks, Molliver. Now, in the pretty likely outcome that everyone falls asleep, then you just say, hey, as you wake up, you are tied to the ground, you look around, and you see that there is a whole bunch of little creatures that are miners, and then there is one human that stands amongst them. But if even one party member is still awake, then you can simply have it be that your players interact with Molliver and the Brigand Rocks just run away. Now, the human in question is Molliver, a member of Valor's Call. Molliver has essentially shown up by chance and is now trying to help out the situation. They believe that the Brigand Rocks are in the right and are trying to help out the situation by defending the Brigand Rocks. The really cute part about this whole encounter is that there's a whole bunch of Brigand Rocks that are hiding about on Molliver and around Molliver, so that's pretty funny. Now, if your players showed up here looking for war, they may just decide to attack or maybe they try and convince Molliver, oh, the Brigand Rocks are bad and the cords are good. 
But if your players showed up and they don't know the situation, then they're probably more than willing to believe what's going on here, especially if they learn that Molliver is a part of a good organization. Now, the fun bit here is once Molliver starts talking to the party, then your players are going to learn some fine details. That Creeping Lynn kidnapped the Brigand Rock's best architect, who now toils in Mother Horn, designing new contraptions for the hag. And the party is also going to be told that the cores provide Creeping Lynn with locks of their magical hair, which she uses to build her contraptions. And this, once again, if your players show up here first, then they may think, okay, the cords are the bad ones, and the Brigand Rocks are good, let's go deal with the cords. You know, I, I just love that whole thing of, you know, both sides are totally wrong, and your players can hopefully put two and two together. Although, funnily enough, your players will learn that the Brigand Rocks work the mine at all hours because they know the noise aggravates the cords. So your players may be thinking, okay, you're like, are the Brigand Rocks the instigators here, or like, what's going on here exactly? Now what's interesting is this may be the first time your players interact with a Valor's Call member. Because the Valor's Call member all the way back in Loom Lurch may have been skipped. Your players may not have gone to the kitchen, Granny Nightshade may not have revealed that information. So this might be the first time your players are hearing of this. And at the same time your players may not have interacted with Zorak, and Zorak may not have given that information out about Valor's Call being at the Palace of Exercise. So your players may not know any of this information. Molliver will reveal that the Valus Call members are actually at the Palace of Arts Desires, though. So if your players don't know any of the information about Valus Call or the League of Malevolence, they may be thinking that there is a good aligned party at the Palace of Arts Desire. But if they do know what's going on and then reveal this information to Molliver, Molliver is still going to say, hey, I need to help these Brigand Rocks and then I'll help later on. Now, once your players have been told this information about the Chord and Brigand Rock interactions, then your players may decide to go deal with the Chords and deal with them maybe in a combative sense or a non-combative sense. So that could certainly happen, especially if your players have already been to the core location and then come back here and then start negotiating the peace treaty. That may very well happen. But what it can also happen is, after conferring with Trig, Molliver will say that the characters can complete a test in order to make their way further into the mines, and make their way through the mines all the way to Motherhorn. In order to pass this test, your players must cross a bridge in order to get to the other side. Pretty simple, right? Well, this test could actually prove incredibly deadly if your players aren't comfortable. Your players will see a large bridge that's 100 feet long, 5 feet wide, but the most important fact of all here is that to either side of this bridge is a humongous pit 200 feet down, and at the bottom are these weird purple glowing things. Now the interesting thing here is there is flame schools that are floating directly underneath the bridge and basically there's going to be no way for your players to see them. However, if you have a passive perception of 10, you're not going to be surprised, which means that you would literally have to have a negative wisdom in order to not be surprised by this, but whatever. So the thing is, is as your players make their way under the bridge, the flame schools are going to rise up. But, the Flame Skulls only attack people who are not past the halfway point, meaning 50 feet. The Flame Skulls will attack anybody that is anywhere between 1 to 50 feet on this bridge. So your players gotta be quick if they don't want to get blown up. Now, of course, we as DMs, we see this and it's like, okay, if they just take the dash action, they're perfectly safe. And that's true. But you gotta remember from a player's perspective here, they're in the middle of a cave, and there is a very, very tight Kazadoom bridge, and this random person they've only just met says, best stay on the bridge and not dilly-dally. Maybe your players think that they're walking into a trap. Maybe your players don't recognize the threat at hand. Maybe your players think that there is a threat, in which case they're going to be cautious. Your players are going to approach this a lot of different ways. It might not just be taking people on blind faith. Your players may be thinking, okay, maybe we want to crawl across this bridge. Maybe we want to try and, you know... Think of this carefully and think this methodically. You know, your players are going to do a lot of different things here. I know one thing a lot of groups are potentially going to do is they're going to tie themselves to each other and slowly cross over. I know for a fact some groups do that because groups love tying rope to each other. So if anybody falls, then everyone else can catch them. And if that is the case, then those flame schools are going to emerge. And I promise you, then bad things are going to happen. Now for flame school tactics here, they're going to attack anybody that's anywhere between 1 to 49 feet. But the thing is, is attacking the flame skulls is completely ridiculous. They are going to either shoot off their fireballs, they're going to do flaming spheres, or they're just going to simply do a little fire ray. So if you have three flame skulls that fireball the bejesus out of a party, that is a potential 24 d6 of damage, which at this point in the game, your players may be level 5, 6, or 7, depending on how things are going on here. 
and unfortunately, most PCs will not be able to survive 24d6 damage, even if they make all of their saves. That may very well be the case. But if you have some people that are able to dodge out of the way, then it's all hunky-dory. So if you want to take it more kind on your party, then you could say that only one cast fireball a turn, and then the rest just do little fire rays, so it's not as bad. You could go down that route. Or you could just simply let them have it and just have three flame skulls rise up, three fireballs hit the party, or just that one individual who's unlucky, and bada bing, bada boom, that's dangerous. But here's the important aspect of this encounter. If anybody makes it past that halfway point 50 feet, then they could turn around to the flame skulls who are going to be indifferent to them and make a DC 13 persuasion check. If the flame skulls are persuaded in this way to allow for safe passage, they apologize for their unprovoked activity and then make their way underneath the bridge, at which point everyone else can cross. So there is just an infinite number of ways your players are going to approach the situation, and it's quite frankly impossible to say because your players may be thinking of all these various scenarios. They may be trying to use spells to fly over. They may be thinking, oh, maybe we can climb against the walls or something. You know, your players are going to get real creative with this one, or they may just decide to simply run across and you don't have to worry about any thinking at all whatsoever. Now, if for some incredibly dumb reason, anybody falls off the edge, which as written, it says that there is no chance of a character accidentally falling off the bridge or being knocked off of the bridge by flame skulls. If for some reason someone does get knocked off for whatever reason, then they fall 200 feet down. So that's 20 D6 worth of damage, quite heavy. And then now they're surrounded by these terrible forgotten wishes. And what's also very interesting is any good aligned character that has one or more of these crystals in their possession feels mildly nauseated. Although the nausea has no mechanical effect. But evil creatures actually do find various ways on how to use these things. Nothing's listed here, but I'm sure there's going to be a lot of creative fun things to be coming with that. Now, once your players have crossed to the other side, that is when they're going to meet up with Obud. Obud has a little house that's built up on the back of a pony, which is pretty freaking cute, honestly. You show this art to your players, and they're absolutely going to love it. Now, Obud, the Brigand Rock, can absolutely show your players the way to that cave that is going to lead your players all the way to Mother Horn, and is actually a very great way to sneak in there. But the thing is, is nothing in this world is free, everything has a price, and Obud is going to want something in return. Now, this could be the peace negotiation between the Brigand Rocks and the Chords, but if that does not come about, then it could be something else. Now, would it be the extermination of the rival Chords? Uh, I, I mean, I guess technically that is a bit morbid, but that's definitely a thing that could happen. But interesting enough, instead of going through an act of combat and war or an act of settling a truce deal, Obud also accepts tasty food, including but not limited to sweets, a wheel of cheese, or a head of lettuce. Candy from the Witchlight Carnival or the Goblin Market in Loom Lurch would suffice. Peace negotiations, war, or candy, apparently they, those all weigh the same. Is what it is, right? This is the land of Prismere. Now, what's very interesting is it states Obud has three such gems of these wish stones in his hut, neatly laid out on the tiny rug. Two of them are worth 100 GP and one is worth 500 GP. If your party decides to steal these things, then Obud's going to not offer help, of course, because your players are scumbags. But it is listed there, so if you have greedy PCs, then maybe they get some sticky fingers and decide that the gold is worth more than helping somebody out. Now, it is in this area where we can find the Tunnel to Motherhorn. So if your players get on Obud's good side by giving him some sort of favor or candy or whatever, then the secret tunnel is going to be revealed, and this leads us all the way to Area M12. This illusory wall has no substance, which means that creatures and objects can pass right through it. Your players can dispel the magic, but that's pretty much pointless. Obud is also going to inform the party that Creeping Lynn does not know that this tunnel exists and doesn't want her to know it exists. If your party uses this tunnel without Obud's consent, Brigand Rock Miners are going to spend the next 8 hours collapsing this thing. So, here's the thing. As written, this does imply that your players could show up here and then not do the favor and then decide, hey, you know, we're actually going to just look around for this mine because we don't want to do a stupid quest or give them anything. And then they just use the mine. But that mine is going to be a one-way trip because as your players get to Motherhorn and then try and look around, then boom, this place is going to be caved in. So it doesn't say that there's any DC or anything of finding this hidden cave. What I would suggest is just if they roll an investigation or they simply imply that they are going to feel around the floors and walls for a hidden entrance, 
then they can make their way through. But here's the thing. If your party does decide to make an enemy of the Brigand Rocks, then that is, of course, one less ally on their side. And, you know, your players may be having a terrible time of it. Now, what's really cute about this area, though, is if your players are friends of the Brigand Rocks, then they can be informed that they can receive their wishes. In the very beginning of the game, your players could have had the timed event where they simply stated out a wish. So you should have written that down in your Witchlight Tracker there, and then boom, you can pull it out all this time later. Now what's really cute about this is if it is a good aligned wish, then it sheds a beautiful bright light, but if it was an evil aligned wish, then it sheds out a tiny but cool purple light. Now also doubling on that is if your players made a common wish, just a very humdrum boring wish, then it's worth 50 GP of gemstone. If it's an unusual wish, it's worth 100. And if it's an exceptionally original wish, then it's 500 GP, as determined by you, because obviously there's just so many factors in there. Figure it out, right? So this is really cool. This is a great way to have your players have this thing of, okay, this is me literally holding on to my wish. That makes sense. That's totally awesome. But the interesting thing here is the Brigand Rocks don't make gemstones out of malignant wish stones. Instead, they toss these purple glowing stones into the chasm. So if anybody had an evil wish, which of course is, you know, sky's the limit with that, then they're not going to have anything special. They're going to have a dud. But if anybody made any good aligned wishes, or just not evil aligned wishes anyway, then your players have that physical representation of their wish, which not only doubles as a light source, but it also means that later on, if they need money, obviously not in this adventure, but once they get back into the real world, then boom, and they can get some good old hard gold. Now for the development here, once again, if your players uh, make themselves uh, allied with one or both of the factions, then this can come in super useful later on once they go to Motherhorn. Pretty great stuff. And also doubling on that is if uh, the Chords and the Brigand Rocks and their Quarrel and launch an assault on Motherhorn, then Molliver and Company is the combined forces. Now, it doesn't state here what happens if your players wipe out the Chords. I do think that if the cords get beaten down or beaten back or you know wiped out, whatever it is they may be, then I think Molliver would be willing to go out because then the Brigand Rocks are pretty much safe, right? It's funny to think how much detail there is between the Lockberry Henge and the Brigand Rock Mine section when it's all technically optional. Your players could skip past all of this and it doesn't affect things too much, but if they do interact with these things, then it affects quite a lot. Just make sure you keep track of what's going on between the relationship between the two factions and how your players interact with them, and make sure that it's more impactful later on once their players finally go to Mother Horn. And lastly, for the name locations in Yawn, we have the Fey Beacons. As your players approach this area, your players see that there's eight giant columns that surround a lake. And they can see that one of the braziers on top of one of these columns is lit. But in addition to that, they're also going to see a sad sight. They're going to see that one individual is trying their hardest to go from one to another and light them all. But unfortunately, eight winged beasts with antlers shout and howl and laughter as they wheel around the fires and eventually put them out. The backstory for this is the figure is Algarthus, a wood elf prince from the material plane. He is trying his hardest to come back to the real world, and the only way he knows how is by coming here, by trying to light these eight beacons and making his way through to the other side. But unfortunately, stopping this whole affair is eight Perrytons who are harassing him and extinguishing the flames, preventing him from lighting all those eight beacons. Alagarthus has the stat block of a knight, but the important and interesting thing here is that they are unarmed and unarmored, so they are pretty much worthless in a fight, right? So once your players get around to seeing this, your players may decide to try and help out this individual because it looks like he's getting harassed. Alagarthus is going to spill the beans about Endolin's castle and about how that Endolin is always trying to recruit new people for her theater and that these Perrytons were once called the Greyhawk Murmurs. Endolin invited them to Motherhorn and then transformed them into these Perrytons who are totally mean now. Now, a cool bit of trivia here is that these Perrytons are actually from the world of Greyhawk and the world of Earth. You know, that's the original D&D &D stuff right there, so pretty cool. The Perrytons remember their former lives, and they all have names, and you should definitely play up the fact that they are intelligent, and they have true backstory. 
Now, like all the encounters in this module, your players could get through this without resorting to combat. Your players could ask them to put on a great show, and if they do, the Peritons are going to absolutely eat it up because they love performing, and if your players sit through the whole show and don't say anything mean, then the Peritons are going to be thrilled and then fly off. But if your party watches this show and they don't get thrilled, if they don't clap and cheer and do whatever else, then the Peritons are going to attack. Once the Peritons are placated or slain, then Alagarthas can light the beacons without issue. But what I would say is it probably doesn't make sense that they would attack until dead. It probably would make sense that they would attack, and if half of them got killed, then the other half would try and fly off. I think that's more reasonable. The other cool aspect is your players could put on a show for the Peritons to try and impress them, and this is going to require a DC-15 group performance check. Now, the thing is, though, is your players could have advantage in this if they got acting lessons from Candlefoot all the way back in Witchlight Carnival. If this group check succeeds, then the Peritons are going to regard their kindred spirits of actors and stop bothering Algarthus, and the Peritons are going to fly back off to Motherhorn. Also really cool is this is one of the locations for the Unicorn Horn, and if your players deal with the Peritons one way or another, then they're going to find it. Once your players have dealt with the Peritons, either by putting on a show or watching their show, or I guess just fighting them off, but fighting them, of course, is super boring. That is when Alagarthus can finally light all eight beacons, and then you can go into detail about that. Beneath the light of all the beacons, you see the reflected mirror-like surface of a lake of a force of an ancient tree shouted in mist, and that is Alagarthus' home. He is going to bow to the party and dive in, and that's that. The interesting thing, though, is it doesn't state anywhere that Alagarthus actually gives anything to the party. So what I would strongly suggest is, to show the act of reciprocity here, Algarthas gives the party something. Now, what is that something? That could be the promise that, hey, when you return to the material world, if you come back to my kingdom, I shall reward you. Or it could be something here. It could be some information about something that's to come. It could be, hey, I know where that unicorn horn is, or if they already have the unicorn horn. Oh, I know for a fact that at the Palace of Heart's Desire, there is this one thing. It could be a number of things, right? I definitely believe that Prince Algartha should give the party something for that act of reciprocity. Now, several things to note here. One, this is another location in this world where your players could decide to make their way back home if they wanted to end this campaign early, or if they just wanted to go back home and then come back here. I've already talked about that before, but what I would say is if you want to have a campaign where they're stuck here forever until they finish the campaign, then make it so they're stuck here. But if you want a campaign where they can hop back and forth, then have it be. But if you want time to go back and forth, then that's perfectly fine. But of course, the important thing here is that this is not the only location in the world where you can return back to the material plane. If your players already know several locations or one of the locations where they can return back to the material plane, they could simply show up to the location, see the prince being harassed by the Peritons, and say, hey, prince, if we take you back to either hither or thither, we know some areas where you can return back to the material plane. In which case, your players don't have to deal with the Fae Beacons, and they don't have to deal with the Peritons. That is a very real possibility. In which case, I would honestly reward the party for going through that effort. That might be a huge issue, of course, that might be an absolute pain, but getting the prince home is what he wants to do. The thing is, though, is that he's specifically been told that this is the way to go home. But if your players convince him that there is another way to go back and they are sincere, then, hey, props to your players and, you know, good thing for Prince Algarthus, right? So with these Fey Beacons, there's certainly a lot to think about because, of course, your players could go through all the rigmarole of dealing with the Peritons, or if they're scared of the Peritons or don't want to deal with them, then they could simply go back to Hither or Thither and say, hey, Prince, here's how you get back home. And that, of course, could be at Bavlorna's, that could be at Granny Nightshades, that could be at the Mushroom Rings, it could be a number of things. I really like this encounter because your players helping out someone that they've only just met for something extremely major is totally awesome. And like I said before, it definitely sets up future campaign material because when your players return, maybe they go and visit the Prince and it turns out the Prince has his own set of issues because of the Green Dragon thing. Totally, totally cool. And also, I really like the Peritons here because the Peritons can definitely be a great source of inspiration. They can definitely be a lot of fun to roleplay as and roleplay against. And I guess if it does come down to combat, then the combat could prove totally deadly. If your players are having to fight 200 feet up on this pillar thing, maybe people get thrown off to the side or whatever. 
I think that's pretty cool. Alrighty, that's going to do it for the name locations. Next time, we're going to be diving into Motherhorn, and there is quite a lot going on there, especially depending on how your players approach this area, depending on how they've approached the rest of the campaign. There is a lot of variables to be dealing with Motherhorn, so we're going to be going into all of that next time. So go ahead and tell me, how do you like the name locations in Yon? Do you like the whole war between the Brigand Rocks and the Chords, or do you think that is just something you can skip by? How do you like Prince Algarthus? Do you think that he's trying too hard for this simple thing? Or do you think that this is the only way for him to go? And how many of these are you going to throw at your party? Are you going to have some of them? None of them? All of them? What's it going to be? Go ahead and tell me those things because I would love to hear it. But that's going to do it for me. Thank you for watching. Thanks for listening. And thank you to my amazing patrons. You guys are absolutely incredible. Thank you so very much. And I cannot wait to see you all in the next one.